Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, I'm the tech guy, so uh, I'll just start fixing things like I've been doing till now. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Carrie O'Connell. I moved here 18 months ago from Berlin. Uh, I was with Nokia Design in Berlin, and um, I was in the Nokia Maps team, so the geolocation unit of uh, Nokia. And uh, previously before that, I'd done some projects for Samsung, and I'd done some projects for Vodafone, working on their handsets and hardware and geolocation technology. So um, I'm actually here to talk about something very dear to my heart, which is uh, crime and crimables, I call them. Um, the rules of distraction. So um, I need for, in order for this to make real sense, I need to go back a little bit, some, some kind of uh, context. So this is the context of then. So this is 1993 and I lived in Bow in East London and uh, I lived in one of these blocks actually they were a bit bigger than that. This is a little conch part of East London and um, back then mobile technology was pretty nascent in the UK. It was just it just come out of the sort of yuppie days and the yuppie boom. It was becoming a bit more affordable. Um, I saved up, I think, £400 and uh, bought a Mercury uh, M300, uh, this, you can't really see it, but it looks like a Motorola StarTac, it was on the flip phones, it was massive, um, Mercury at the time had launched this service, they were trying to get as many people as possible onto it, um, using the thing called the PCS network, which was before the GSM network uh, that we have now. and. Uh, uh, I got this phone, I bought it second hand, I was like completely amazed by it, I was like wow, I, I'm in the future, this is it, it's amazing, I can call three of my friends on this that have the same handset, so you know, it had free SMSing and stuff, and for the three friends that I had that, that, that had this, um, it was actually designed by IDEO, they, they, they designed this, and uh, like I said, it was built on the, uh, the Motorola StarTac. So I felt fully empowered and uh, I was like, wow, that's it, I'm, I'm mobile, I'm connected, I can talk to people, I can message. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So uh, um, I like to use it. Mobiles are supposed to be used, right? So you've got it in your, you know, you've got it in your pocket and uh, obviously, you know, you normally have to pull it out of your pocket to uh, answer a phone call. So um, I'm using this thing and uh, wandering around my hood and just thinking it's all good, it's all good like this. And uh, middle of the day on a Saturday, the market was full of people, walking down the street and uh, I get approached by three guys. So one's coming towards me, two are coming behind me. And uh, I, I, at the same time my phone rings, so I'm like reaching in my pocket and I'm like, I'm like oh, I'm, I'm one, of my, one of my friends is calling me like this. I'm like, I'm like this, and I'm like, hey, 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 I see these guys walking towards me. And so I go to like, take it down, because you learn in those areas, like the, the value of things, and uh, you understand that something is, I had a feeling, a sensory feeling, something was gonna happen. So I start putting my in my pocket, and uh, shutting the phone, and um, they're like, hey, can we have a look at the phone? Have a look at the phone, mate, come on, you know, let's just have a look at it, like this. I'm thinking, okay, I know what's gonna happen now. So I get it kind of in my pocket, and then the two come from behind me and they grab my arm and uh, basically they pin me against the wall in an alleyway and they have like a, a thing called a Stanley knife and they, they pull the knife to my throat and they're like, give us the phone now. Or basically, well, you know, I'll fucking kill you like this. So I, was, I didn't want to argue. I was like, oh, okay, then uh, take my phone, you know. So uh, they take the phone off me and they, they walk off laughing. They just walk away, like no fear of consequence or anything. So, I mean, there was CCTV cameras in all the corners, so I was like, right, I'm gonna get you. I'm definitely gonna get you, right? So, um, I go off, shaken, to the, uh, to the um, police station, local Bow police station, and I walk in, and uh, yeah, I go and report the, report the crime, and uh, so police just tell me, so what was it, so, you know, and it's like, uh, oh, it's, um, it's a mobile phone, and you know, uh, they have to give a description of the people, and et cetera, et cetera. And I say, look, how, how likely am I to get this back? I can't, I, it's 400 pounds, and I'm like shaking like a leaf. I, I can't talk to my three friends anymore. Like, they're gonna think I'm dead or something. Um, 
And he just basically said, and I always remember this, he said, uh, you'll never ever get this back, it's gone, right? So uh, he said, my advice to you is do not answer phones in public in these areas and use only when hidden, as in I'm hidden behind something. Don't use them in these areas, because at that time, it was kind of, it taken off and it had a lot of value. So I went away and uh, went back home and cried. And uh, I was feeling pretty vexed, actually. Um, vexed is, I guess, everyone knows what the word vexed is, like angry, like, how can this happen, you know? Um, I'm gonna call the police, so I haven't got a phone now anymore. Um, so the mid to late 90s in the UK was actually a pretty special time um, because it was a time of like technological paranoia and kind of pre-millennial angst about what was to come. You know, you had the fear of the Y2K thing, there was uh, um, the CCTV, and this was all over the UK, so it was like real total totalitarian fear. Um, the internet was emerging, people were starting on the internet, there was fear of this. Uh, there was privacy fears, you know, the panopticon, etc. Um, civil liberties were at stake, a lot of laws were passed in the 90s to stop people playing loud music and stop congregating together, and etc. So generally it was like a really odd time of pressure. And uh, one of the areas that was really heavily influenced by the prevailing mood um, was uh, fashion. And uh, you, you can't really see it clearly because they always made sort of black clothing. But this is a jacket by a company called Vex Generation in the UK. And they were uh, really well known because they, they kind of symbolized, summed up the feeling at the time in the UK, this sort of fear of being observed. And also it was about, they were trying to tap into this inner city angst as well. So um, this, this particular jacket was designed to conceal the face. So you zip it up and you literally just have like a little space here that you can see out of. It has a, a filter to filter the polluted air. And it has a special areas on the sides of the, um, of the jacket to stop you being knifed. So they made out ballistic nylon so that in the event of a knife attack in the UK, you could wear this thing and you could somehow survive. So I mean, these were the, this is what people were trying to buy in, in, in those days. And it wasn't cheap either, it was like 500 pounds or something like this. So I didn't, obviously I didn't have one. Um, yeah, they also had uh, internal routing. They were one of the first jackets to have internal routing for hands-free phone talking. And of course, back then it was like the wire and the earpiece, single sort of mono earpiece. And they allowed you to put the phone in and you could like internally route this and have this in here. And then, of course, when you had the, the hood up and zipped up, nobody knew you were talking. You couldn't even see the mouth move, you couldn't see if people were talking or not. So this was kind of interesting, this idea of concealment, of stealth. Um, so, yeah, people became obsessed with stealth towards the millennium, and uh, being stealthy and that kind of feeling and approach, it allowed you to move with relative safety in a city, or you felt that you were safe because you, people could not observe your interactions. So they were kind of abstracted out there. You could see something, but you weren't really sure. And of course in the city it's all about, you know, uh, staying relatively incognito, especially in like the poorer areas. So it was really about, you know, being, not drawing attention to yourself, which is kind of ironic because you're wearing a 500 pound jacket. Um, technology like mobile phones started to become increasingly concealed when I was living there because of this fear that, you know, if you're pulling it out your pocket, you, people were getting mugged all over the place. I mean, they're pulling it out and they're like this and then psh, it's gone and then it's like, okay, I need to get another one and so on and so forth. So uh, people are starting to keep the phones in the pockets and they were using these wired hands-free kits. So uh, um, yeah, that was the millen turn of the millennium and then something came along. Um, something I call the millennium turkey. So this was, uh, I don't maybe you older people in here recognize this. This is a Bluetooth headset. Uh, this is, uh, I think, made by Jabra. This came out in end of 99, 2000. And uh, so Bluetooth headsets were born, and uh, Nokia and Ericsson and Jabra and all that were really pushing the technology at the time. Free your hands! You're always able to talk. Nobody knows you've got a phone. Obviously you do, because it's connected via Bluetooth. Um, so these, these headsets retail for around 200 pounds when they first came out. Uh, being a bit of a mug, I bought one as well at that time, which I regretted later. But uh, um, then, you know, this kind of feeling emerged. Um, and it started to grow in the UK, being a relatively cynical place and always sort of testing oneself about technology. 
So, I mean, this is, I mean, I'm not sure there's that much love in there, and I'm sure people have seen people like this before, um, you know, uh, and try to avoid them, but um, it, there, there was a real fear of drawing to oneself, and of course you had a blue LED on flashing on the side to tell everyone that you've got some kind of space wear or, or something like this. So it ended up, uh, again, being a kind of niche for taxi drivers, delivery men, people in cars. It, it, it went from trying to be something that was launched that would be for the masses and mass adoption and hands-free and phones in the pocket, etc., to uh, becoming something that was useful only for a subset of people and everyone else just had them in their cupboards. Um, there was another, uh, uh, you can't really see this guy, he's wearing two Bluetooth headsets at the same time. He's hyper-connected and this is a character from the UK called uh, Nathan Barley, and there was a TV program that was based on him in the early 2000s. He described himself as a self-facilitating media node, and it was basically ridiculing this uprising of just crazy technology and sticking things all over yourself, and he's got, he's got all sorts of, and he was, he was hated across the UK. He was a figure of hatred. So, but he was a successful program. Um, so Bluetooth headsets, I mean, the carriers and the mobile uh, phone manufacturers just started bundling this with, uh, with mobile phones, just giving them away. It's like, buy a phone, here, have two Bluetooth headsets, or three, or just give them to everyone like this. And even still, nobody really used these things. You know, I have at home, I have an embarrassingly large connection of technology, and part of that is random Bluetooth headsets through the ages. They didn't really develop, they got a little bit smaller, but they, they never really changed, and I never, ever wore or used them. So, that was around 2000. So then, of course, comes uh, 2001, and then this happened, and there's not really a need to necessarily explain this, but the iPod is launched around the world, and it's launched in the UK. And Mac fans, like myself, uh, I was rejoicing, this is it, you know, it's the evolution, the revolution of music, and um, it disrupted the whole idea of, of portable music, as we know, which obviously Sony had safely uh, held on to this point. So it was, in that way, it was really disruptive. But, and, and Apple wanted, you know, obviously everyone to know you have an iPod. It was brilliant, right? So, I mean, we all know. How do you know if you have an iPod? You have the white earbuds. So the white earbuds became ubiquitous in the UK. And iPod owners are, were immediately recognizable on the street. But it was a niche product when it launched because it was only for Mac users. So, you know, you could count them, you know, probably they'd fill this room in the UK at that time. Um, and so, you were actually, you, you, no one knew what it was on the street. You'd be like, hey, look at what I've got. And they're like, I have no idea what it is. Which means that also, they don't know what it's worth, they don't know what you paid for it or anything like this. So there's no indication. But um, it, uh, uh, the next generation of it, of course, was, uh, uh, launched in the UK and that was available for PC if you remember back so this changed everything because suddenly it became a mass consumer product and uh, even though it was great its value was uh, quite low uh, initially um, because the, what, it, it took a while to actually build up because you've got to remember Apple was not the, the Apple that we know today but on the PC it did start becoming everywhere and then and then this happened so these are pictures of the UK uh, the streets of the UK so uh, I went back there, I was living in Berlin, and I went back to visit the UK around 2002. And I got off the plane, and, and uh, I was I got on the tube, and I was going into town, and uh, I saw these signs, like, this is your greeting, welcome to the United Kingdom. So it's like, you are gonna be robbed, right? If you give any indication that you have anything of value, pretty much, you're gonna be robbed, right? And uh, you can see in the graphic, although it's, it's a bit hard to see, you know, the indication is the white earbuds. It's like saying, look, I have an iPod. It's basically saying, I have at least 300 pounds in my pocket at any time, like this. So, you know, clever people would use the branded headphones in order to give no indication of financial value. So it was like this retro approach, and I think, Somebody tried to build a, a case that looked like a Zoom, so that you could put the iPod in the Zoom, because so, no one wanted the Zoom, right? So it's worthless, they're rubbish. Um, so uh, there, were, there was the rise of trying to conceal it, make it look like an old uh, Walkman, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I just wanna go from something like this to something like this. I think most people have probably seen this before. This is the, uh, 
the infamous hype cycle diagram of technology. So um, you basically, you know, you start with a technology trigger. You, you can actually map this to most uh, technology that's come out. You have this kind of way adoption. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Uh, the peak of inflated expectations. And it's like, it's amazing. It's like everyone's got it. Everyone's got it. And, oh, the trough of disillusionment's arrived. So, you know, think of Bluetooth headsets. It's like, oh, okay, this is kind of some rubbish, actually. Um, then you have a slow slope of enlightenment, and again, going back to the Bluetooth headsets, um, you basically had you know, the adoption by the taxi driver. Well, actually, in a certain situation, you're not looking like a dog, you can actually wear this thing, and it does actually help me drive with both hands and you know, call people and receive calls. So uh, this is over time, right? So it's like the maturity model of technology as, as Moore's invested into it. So um, I like to uh, imagine if you changed you know, the way that uh, the, the hype cycle was, well, so now you have sales, like shifting boxes, and you have over time, then actually what you can do is change this to the crimeability scale. Because, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not a criminal, I just I made that clear, but I know people who've done naughty things. And so I, I, you get to know a little bit about how they think, and it's kind of interesting, because this is the same model for, for crime. It's like technology comes out. In other words, they can map it to the iPod, to the first generation iPod. It's just some nerds, and nobody wants it. There's no value to this, because no one's going to buy it or ask for it or anything like this. And then, of course, sales increase. And again, if you use the iPod model, um, you end up with something super popular. And I put the, the dollar signs there, which means you know, for a criminal, it's like that's maximum return, right? This is the time to grab these things, right? And then you get to a point where market saturation occurs. And then the criminals are like, you know what? I've got been getting these things, and it's, you know, everyone's got one now. So I mean, I can't really sell it even to anybody. Um, and then, of course, it kind of levels out, goes back up in value and, and, and levels off, and then you continue with your, 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 your crimes. But um, obviously, you know, you should probably should maximize your crime in this area here. This is the best time, just to advise, to, 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 to do this. But um, the problem, you know, from our cyborg camp opinion when we're talking about technology is that um, it's actually when we need the mass adoption point. This is the, 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 the tipping point where it can be make or break for a technological introduction. So how does this relate to wearable technology? So now we're going to jump ahead, and now it's the context is right now, what we have in the world around us right now. So I mean, uh, it's 2013, and we're on the cusp of a wearable revolution. And uh, hopefully we have your continuous partial attention now. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what continual partial attention is, but it's the process of uh, paying simultaneous attention, just as I'm doing now, um, to a number of sources uh, of incoming data and information. But it, on a superficial level, it's like surface skimming. You're just picking things up and you're, you know, you're taking and, and dipping in what you need, but you're not really absorbing the, the, the quantity of information. This will come more relevant later. So now we've seen those cool people with their headsets. Um, we're going to go to the quantified self. So now what we have is, you've got some uh, people here, this is like Pebble and Fitbit and Fuel Band and stuff we all know, and uh, I think, yeah, you've got Sergey Brin on the tube chilling on his Google Glass, and it's, like, it's not set up at all, he just always takes the tube in New York. Um, but the quaint basically means peculiar or unusual in an interesting or amusing way. Almost like a quaint sense of humor. It's almost humorous. Um, but it's also skillfully or cleverly made. So this is something that I've really thought about, is what it makes me feel when I see a lot of this stuff at the moment. Like, we're really starting to, it's coming in, it's coming in. People are adopting it. Um, now we have the adoption cycle. So you have the pebble, and you have the glass, and, and the Fitbit, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the adoption has to be the same. It has to go right up. And it needs to get to here in order to generate real value for users. That utility that they were talking about initially becomes the accepted norm and is proven model. Because it's now everywhere, things are being developed for it, like apps and various other things. But there's always this, you know, if you don't fulfill that, there's this danger of idea death. And, and I'm going to play on this idea of not designed to be hidden. Um, so. These products are generally not designed to be hidden wearables. I mean, that's 
Steve Martin from the jug. Um, but they're designed to be for the most permanently attached uh, to your, some part of your body, right? And in order to deliver on their promise, uh, they need to be always on, always, connect, always able to connect at any time. Um, but we don't live in a world that really allows you to wear this stuff. Oh, I didn't live in a world that would allow me to wear this stuff all the time because it would be gone, right? I, it's not, I have it for five minutes, um, maybe less. Because uh, humans suffer from envy, jealousy, drunken stumbling, falling over, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it often makes me, well, who, I don't know who's this for, you know? I mean, it's not really designed for me. So who's, who are these products designed for? Well, they're basically they're designed for people like these guys, right? It's a self-fulfilling thing. It's like, it's, so you've been looking uh, pensive, and everybody knows Scoble in the shower, and I had to get him up there because he's obviously doing the rounds on, the, on Twitter at the moment. But it makes me feel like this is, this is what these products are actually designed for. They're a showcase, but they're not for real people. They're not really for mass consumption. So, um, yeah, they, they, these, these people don't live anywhere where I've lived ever in, in my life. Maybe, okay, maybe Vancouver, maybe a little bit. Um, but it made me think one of William Gibson's obviously most famous quotes is, uh, you know, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And I've been thinking about this quote and thinking, what, what, what does that really mean? And in my head, you know, it, it, it kind of means that uh, it never will be evenly distributed because it can't be. These things cannot live in certain environments. They will not be adopted and they won't be able to get to that tipping point because once they attain financial value, they'll disappear. They'll be gone. And the reason is because you can't hide them. So this is again, you know, to go back, if I'm in a, in a dangerous situation and I have my phone with me, everybody probably in this room slits it into their pocket. They're not wandering around areas that they don't understand going like this. You know, I'm just looking on a map. I'm just gonna, well, you know, somewhere really bad. Um, in, uh, uh, in South Africa some years ago, Nokia did a, a, a study, and we used to do lots and lots of studies, it cost lots and lots of money. Um, didn't really work out, but uh, um, <laughs> it was called Location Matters. It was, it, a big book was published uh, uh, internally about this, and um, one of the interesting things about it was, of course, they went to these uh, poor areas, and. Uh, uh, talking about, you know, do you want maps? Do you want all these things that we take for granted? And of course, everybody's like, yes, of course we do. And they're like, brilliant, you know, they're like marketers are like, brilliant, we can get them on apps, we can get them doing this thing. And they're like, yeah, but we can't not only afford the devices, but um, if we have the device, we won't have the device very long because somebody's going to rob us for it, right? I mean, it was just rife. So we would prefer to just have a, a dumb phone and just you know, do without because uh, we don't have, definitely don't have the money to replace these objects like you do in, in, the, in the Western world. So you know, again, it was just uh, um, it was a risk versus reward model. And uh, I think the risk far outweighed being able to find yourself in Nokia Maps because you could have your arm chopped off to grab the phone. So um, you know, what should we do then? So as a designer, I'm a designer, so I'm trying to work out what should we do? What can we do about this? You know, I've been in a lot of product teams and I see how products are designed and uh, tested and showcased and often it's a very perfect world scenario. Um, and one good way I like to look at it is um, what would James Bond do? Because, you can't really see it actually, it's a bit dark. It says discrete wear, not street wear. So the idea is that um, James Bond, I mean, he needs access to lots of technological information all the time. But he's not walking around with a pebble and a, and a Google Glass on incognito in a foreign country or dangerous environment because it wouldn't really work. So everything is hidden, everything is stealth, right? And what we really want is not to show off our devices, but to actually access the information that it allows us to, uh, to absorb. And then the conundrum comes, because if you have hidden devices that are like, like him, you wouldn't know what he's got, which means you can't market them. How do you sell and tell people what they are when you can't see them? So this creates a bit of a conundrum. Um, so there are companies that are actually um, trying to look at other ways of being able to control interfaces and different ways of interaction with uh, data. Um, 
One is the uh, Mayo gesture armband. I don't know if uh, anyone has seen this here. And um, this is interesting, actually, because um, you wear it on your arm, you can wear it anywhere on your arm, um, but what it picks up is muscle movement, so it knows kind of like if you have it on your arm, and I've got it kind of like here, um, it'll know uh, if I've got my hand like this and like this, but it also knows if I'm clamping like this, and it also knows um, if I'm doing this or doing any kind of movement whatsoever. So it, what it means is, um, I didn't have the video to show on here because it's embedded in their site, but uh, it shows uh, it being used in a, a dangerous situation under clothes, and it's just some very, very slight movements of the arm is used. Just very, very slight, because it picks up the ligaments and translates those into gestures. And I thought this was really interesting, because of course, you, you, yeah, you can't, uh, you, you, you won't see this. I, I could wear this on the street, and uh, I, I might look a bit weird going like this, hey, it's all right, man, you know, I'm just checking my email or something like this. Um, but, uh, at the end of the day, it's not something that's physically there that's broadcasting that you have money and you've got like, you know, $1,000 strapped to your face or something like this. So I think this is kind of interesting. Another angle with uh, the design of these objects is um, what I call moral life cycles. This is Daniel Liebskind, and um, he's a famous architect. Um, and he recently uh, was quoted uh, in various design and architecture things, talking about uh, the moral, um, uh, basically the designers should be morally responsible not only for the creation of the product, but how the product is used. And I think, to be honest, I tend to agree with that. I don't, I don't believe that uh, you should make products and fire them out into the world and say, that's not my problem. Just because it's you know, like stuck on her face and they had it stolen, that's not my problem. It's like, how can we minimize that to happen, and I think that's good design. So, um, yeah, he proposed that architects should be held uh, morally responsible for the creation and usage of the buildings that they design. I think he called them gleaming towers for despots. Um, and he's trying to rally against this, and of course in, uh, in the world of design, this is something that uh, is very current and very now. Uh, I, I, I embrace it, um, but in the end, everything we design and develop and distribute should be for the betterment of mankind. It's not for the product manufacturer, it's not as a logo, it's not as streetwear, it's not to do anything else but to um, basically enable humans to get better information faster and quicker. And if we can do that in a subtle way, if we can do that in a way that will help all areas of society, then I think that there's a real chance that things would be adopted. I think that you know the Bluetooth headset approach and stuff um, will end up going away and we'll have a much better way of doing it, like the Maya one band. But uh, yeah, we're at the cusp of a next generation of wearable products and services, and let's try to allow as many people as possible to enjoy the benefit of the information age. Thank you very much, and um, yeah, that's it.